So I've ripped out the old kitchen and I rebuilt it from scratch. I'm quite good at carpentry and I'm quite good at electrics. Um, I wired all the sockets in here, I did the lighting and I built all the benches myself. Uh, the one thing I, I don't like doing is plumbing. Uh, I've got a very good plumber, Brian, uh, who has done the plumbing in, in the kitchen and in the other places. So I'm standing underneath the living room where I showed you the pipe was going into the floor. And that pipe um, comes through here and then it splits off into two, all right? Uh, one of them goes inside the wall and it goes, it feeds the cold tap and then the other one goes into this oversink water heater. It's a gravity fed water heater. You need to get a gravity fed one if you're gonna do it like this, not a mains fed one. Uh, so that goes through the water heater and then that comes out uh, at the hot tap, right? There are two normal taps on this sink. So I've got four taps going into this sink. This is just as it would be in a normal house. So the hot on this tap is coming from a combi boiler and the cold tap is just coming from the water mains. With these two taps, the cold tap is coming to just directly from the water butt and the hot tap is coming from the water butt but it's fed through the water heater and if you want uh, if you want it to heat up you just switch it on uh, this light comes on and when that light goes off it means that the water is hot and you, you can control the temperature that the light goes off at as well or that it switches off at the thermostat uh, and then you've got seven and a half liters of hot water in about 10 minutes uh, which is enough to wash the dishes. If you needed more water, you would just leave it switched on, the light goes out, you fill the sink, and then just keep filling the sink. So you could wash clothes in this sink. That's why I've installed such a big sink, because if the, if the mains water was to be lost, you wouldn't then have use of your washing machine, because that's fed by the water mains, but you could uh, use the water from the water butt, heated through this water heater to wash clothes in here. Right, so the red light's gone out on the water heater, which means that uh, the water's ready to come out with a hot tap. Let me just switch that on. And that's, that's too hot to touch there now. Right, so I would need to add some cold water in there. So that's hot and cold coming from the water butt. You see that the hot's running a little bit slower, but it's, it's going through there. That's still, that's still hot there. Still running hot. Right, it's starting to go warm there now. Okay, so we've got about a quarter of a sink of hot water, which, as I said, that's enough to do dishes in. Okay, so let's have a look at this water. So that's it from the water butt, right? It's fairly clear. Now I don't drink this and uh, I think the regulations say that I should have these taps labelled saying non-potable water or don't drink and the pipes as well. That's, that's, that's a job I've, I've got on my list of things to do. So how do we make this water suitable for drinking? Well this is how I've been doing it. Um, I've been filling this kettle. Um, put the kettle on the log burner stove, so I boil the water and then I let the water cool and I put it into a, a water filter. I've been drinking this water for months now and uh, I'm still here. Uh, I've given it to other people and they say that it's less harsh than tap water. So just get a normal glass of tap water and a glass from the roof which has been boiled and filtered and it has a much less harsh taste. Um, 
when Brian the plumber was uh, working here, I would always make him a cup of coffee and he got quite paranoid that I was using water from the roof for his coffee. <laughs> I did make him one cup that he drank that was made from the roof, but don't tell him that. With him being a plumber, he's obviously up to speed on a lot of the regulations and the reasons why the regulations are there to protect against Legionnaire's disease and all this sort of thing, but uh, uh, I haven't had Legionnaire's disease yet. The other advantage is this hasn't had anything added to it. Obviously, there's no fluoride in there. Uh, this, this filter is a, a heavy metal filter, so it will filter out the smallest particles. So we've got drinking water and we've got uh, water for doing dishes and cooking. Um, you could use that kitchen sink to wash clothes in using the water heater to heat the water. So you don't necessarily need a washing machine. Now what about going to the toilet? So I'm back here on the middle level and when I got the house uh, there was a wall going along here and I pulled that wall down and there was actually a, a really decrepit old shower unit in here. So I pulled all that out and I made it into a downstairs toilet. All right. Now, when I did this, I felt the wall just to the right of the toilet and I could feel it was hollow. So I put my hammer through it and there's a big cavity in there, enough space to build a big cupboard, right? So um, I built the toilet and I built a big cupboard. So that's been a cupboard for the last five years. So I thought, well, um, I could put a water tank in there because if you're going to use the the rainwater to go to the toilet you need a tank a large tank to store the water that you're going to collect from the roof now that tank has got to sit higher than your toilet in order for the water to go from the tank into your system so the obvious place for this was the toilet on the middle level and to fit the tank just above the toilet and then to find a drain pipe that i could connect to outside of the toilet Voila, my toilet. And you'll notice a framed letter above the toilet, which is a personally signed letter from David Cameron. You may remember many years ago, I challenged David Cameron on the subject of UFOs and UFO secrecy. Uh, I wrote to him and he wrote back. So I thought the most appropriate place for a letter from David Cameron was in the bog. So here I am, and obviously this is where I do all my most critical thinking. And this is the, the cupboard here that I built five years ago, which we see now has a big tank in it. So um, I built this wooden frame uh, to house this, well, it's a, I think it's a 105 litre tank. So when that's full of water, you're talking over 100 kilos, which is bigger than a large person. So it needed to be quite a strong uh, frame to carry it. 105 litre tank, you can see it's nearly full of water there. Um, so this is um, the same MDPE pipe as I've used for the water butt. So that I'll just film up here. It goes up there. Um, so I did this plumbing, Brian didn't do this bit. I'm okay with the MDPE stuff and that goes out of the building and then it joins onto another drain pipe, a different one, right? So I, you can see there, I've put a little valve in just in case you have any problems and I need to cut it off. Um, so when it rains, uh, the water just comes into this tank via this, this pipe. Now, it took me quite a few months to get this right because at first um, I didn't fit a valve inside the tank which was what's called a float valve. It's used in farming for filling up like cattle um, drinking troughs and things like that. So I, I thought that, that as long as this lid here was watertight, just put that lid on there, that the water would fill in and then the pipe would fill up when the tank fills up, just as it does with the normal water butt. But one thing that was happening is I was getting airlocks in this pipe and the water wasn't coming in. Right, so that's why I installed this valve. What this valve does is as the water comes in, it lets the air out of the tank, right? And then when the tank fills up, the water pushes up there and it closes the valve. So it lets air out, but not water, which was working okay, but I couldn't, I couldn't get this lid to stop leaking. So whenever it was full, um, it, 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 it would leak. So I decided 
as Brian recommended in the first place, and I should have just listened to him, um, there's, a, there's actually a float valve in there, which um, when the water gets to this height, it just shuts it off, shuts off the, the water coming in. You're not getting as much water in there now. You, it's not filling it right to the top, but at least it's a bit more safe. Brian plumbed the bottom part of it in, which I'll just show you, right? So obviously you're gonna get some dirt in the water there. So what he's done is he plumbed a valve in there and um, this is a filter. So if you switch this off, you can take that off with a spanner and just clean the mesh filter out. So it means that you're getting reasonably clean water coming into the toilet, all right? So that's, that's plumbed into the bottom of the tank, all right? So that pipe then comes into, um, well, there's a couple of valves down here now that Brian's put in. So there's one valve turns the tank on and off and the other valve turns the mains on and off. So the way I've got it configured at the moment, the mains is on and the tank is off. So if I flush the toilet now, Right. That'll the the cistern will fill up really quickly because it's filling from uh, mains water. It's got mains water pressure. You can hear it filling there now. Just let that fill. So what I'm going to do is I'm first going to turn the mains water off to the toilet, which is this valve here. Just turn that through 90 degrees, and then this. Um, connects the tank water to the toilet. Right, so if I now flush the toilet, right, that now is, is filling up from the tank. Okay, so there we are, the toilet flushing using rainwater. And in the tank, I've got probably about 85 litres of water in there which at four litres of flush is over, over 20 flushes. Now, if you're economic with your toilet use, and by that I mean you only flush when you've had a number two, and you just don't bother with a, num a number one, you could get away with one flush a day, right? Uh, so, uh, that's gonna last you three weeks, right? The water in here could last three weeks. Now it's fairly rare in Wales for it to go for three weeks without it raining. It did uh, earlier this year, it was, we, uh, we had about a month without rain, right? Now in that situation, you could always just get a bucket of water, take, take water out of the other water butt and just flush the, the, the toilet by pouring water down it, right? So um, with, this, with what I've put in place here, it's possible for your whole toilet use to be run purely by rainwater, so you're off the grid. Now there are other ways of getting water other than collecting it from your roof. I'm stood here next to a spring, which is not far from Merthyr Tidville, and I have used this spring in the past to get drinking water from. <laughs> I'll write the address down next, is it? <laughs> Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> Dad. Yeah, I'm just filming the, uh, the spring. Yeah? yeah. So where the where the bottom of Toganello? Uh, not far from Domino's. Right. The Bailey side or the other side? <laughs> the Bailey side. There's some shit houses over there. You don't look as if you live in the shit house. <laughs> Well, it was a shit house. <laughs> it's not so shit now. The big one with the windows on the side. Windows on the side. With the alley going down. That's the one. Where did you live before there? Uh, County Durham. <laughs> In England. He's in, asking where he's English. That's why you're not getting. Are much you sense. English? I'm English. That's, that's why you're not that's getting a proper bloody answer. That's why. Uh, <laughs> County, mind you, not so bad up up north. Yeah. A lot 
a lot different than down. <laughs> Are you from up north? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What made you come to me with it? Yeah, because that house is looking a lot better than it was. Yeah. Because it's a stupid uh, big house. Oh yeah, it's a big house, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's a stupid bloody spot. I don't know. Then again, well, it's a stupid looking. Careful, you! <laughs> yeah, there you got me again, look, smiley. <laughs> The other thing I've been using this water for is to water the vegetables, which I'll come onto when we come onto food. So I can use this water for cooking, uh, I can drink it once it's been filtered, uh, I can use it to wash the dishes, um, I can use it to wash clothes. Uh, now the other question which arises is bathing. What about actually cleaning yourself? Well, um, obviously my shower and my bath are connected to the mains water. This is one of the areas that I haven't covered very well. I suppose at a last resort, you could get a sponge and just stand in front of the sink and wash yourself that way. You could always take a dip in your local river. I'm going to cover energy next and we'll come back to food a bit later. So let's come on to energy. Uh, I'm standing here in the hallway uh, next to the front door and just above here in, in this box here that you can't see, it, that's my consumer unit uh, which was here when I bought the property. Now this property um, in terms of energy is supplied by electric and gas so let's cover the electric first. Uh, now I, I don't think it's practical in today's world to live without electricity. I think we all want electric to run all of our uh, devices etc. So um, <clears throat> in order to be self-sufficient with energy I think it's useful to have your own electric generation right. Uh, so I've gone for solar, solar power probably the most common way of generating your own electricity at this time. Uh, now I decided to go for quite a, a bulky system. Um, now this is the, by far the most expensive thing that I've spent my money on with regards to this project uh, this was uh, fifteen and a half thousand pounds, all right. But you'll see that the system is um, pretty state of the art. Now, um, I have gone for a Tesla system. Um, I looked at the market, and from what I could see, this was by far the best system. The panels are not um, Tesla panels, solar panels, um, but the the battery, which is here, uh, and the um, the gateway, uh, they're both Tesla left a sour taste in my mouth because as you may know I do not like Elon Musk but from what I could see uh, th that was the best system. I've got quite a lot of roof space here uh, I've had 21 solar panels fitted so there's 10 face west and I've got seven facing east and a further four facing south. Now each of those panels is capable of generating 320 watts of electricity at its maximum. Now just to put that in perspective, if I'm not running any large devices in the house, no, no washing machine or kettles etc, it's just running in its normal computers, lights, fridge etc, you're looking at about 300 watts. So in theory you could supply the whole house on one solar panel if it's just not running any large devices. Uh, but I've got 21 panels, right, so that the, the maximum capacity of that system is uh, 30, 320 times 21 is 6.7 kilowatts, which is way above anything that, that I would use in the, in the house. Um, now, you don't get that maximum capacity because the sun is not always um, optimally placed for each of the panels at any one time, but I have had uh, 5 kilowatts coming from the panels on a nice sunny day. So how does the system work? Well the clever bit um, is this box of tricks here which is called the gateway and what that's doing is controlling the, the electrical power flow uh, to and from four different things. So that's uh, the electricity grid, um, the solar panels, uh, the battery and the house. All right so you have a a flow of power which is varying all the time between those four things. Obviously uh, the battery, uh, the power flows into the battery when it's being charged and out of the battery at night when the house is running off the battery. Um, the solar panels obviously that's a one direction flow of power uh, and that will flow 
uh, through the gateway and it will it will power the house if you've got an, if there's enough energy left over it will charge the battery and then if there's enough energy left over after that it will it will put that out into the grid now this battery uh, is rated at 14 kilowatt hours that means it'll run for 14 hours and pump out a kilowatt of power for 14 full hours which is more than enough to keep your house powered overnight when there's no sun if you're conservative with your energy use you might get two days use out of this battery so that's the principle of this system that your house will uh, be powered by the solar panels during the day there'll be enough power in the battery then to keep you going overnight and then when it comes to the next day the battery starts charging again so you're completely off the grid I've had this system installed since September last year and the amount of grid energy that I've used is absolutely minimal <clears throat> only in December and January was I using energy from the grid so this has reduced my electric bill to almost zero now this system also heats my water right so I've installed an immersion heater in the loft and when there's excess energy from the solar power system which there usually is that then heats the water so it means that the water is no longer being heated by gas so that then saves on the gas bill so if you lose the electricity supply to your house uh, this system will keep you powered off grid uh, it, you, you might have a problem in some of the winter months in, in December or January when there's less sun. Uh, now I've thought about that and um, so I've, inst I've actually installed some additional wiring. Uh, so the, the switch on the right there, what that does is it disconnects the house's consumer unit from the grid and then the grid includes the solar panels and, and the Tesla system. Right, so, so the house is completely disconnected from everything. And then you throw the switch again, and it's, it's connecting the, the, the house uh, to these cables that I've installed, right? And I've run these cables, so they will carry about 40 amps, right? I've wired them to an outside input socket, right? So you could potentially connect an electric generator and run the house off a diesel or a petrol generator situated outside so I've installed all of the wiring to be able to do that I haven't bought an electric generator yet you can get them for about 700 quid for about the seven and a half kilowatt generator all right and so you would need to store either diesel or petrol right so the idea would would be if you're in a winter month and you've got no uh, sunshine for for some days the, the Tesla system wouldn't be able to cope with that so you would just let's say midday you'd switch it to the generator so you'd run the house in the afternoon on the generator you'd do your washing do anything that uses a lot of electrical power maybe even heat the house a bit uh, and during that time the battery would charge up because the, um, the solar panels would not be supplying anything other than the battery right so when the Sun then goes in you switch your generator off and then you, you should hopefully then have enough power in the battery to, to get you through the night. So with this system, um, you can be completely off grid. So what about selling energy back to the grid? Because my system, especially in these summer months, it is generating excess energy, which is just going straight out to the grid that the electric company are selling to other people. Uh, now, the one thing that knocks me about that is the, generally the rate that you'll get for each unit of electricity is about a third of what they would normally charge you a third right so that's pretty paltry uh, and if you calculate the total amount of revenue that it would generate right you're not talking a lot of money per annum right uh, with it being a third of the price that you would that you buy the electricity and the other thing that the electricity company told me that I would ha I would have to have a smart meter put in if I wanted to do that so I've just opted not to sell my um, excess energy back to the grid. I don't really want to have anything to do with them. Um, I could, if I wanted to, just isolate the grid from the house and I'm sure I would be okay, right, without any connection to the grid. Now, because the system does work in, in that mode. Uh, now, when I had the system installed, the electricity meter was an old electricity meter and the, the, the guys who installed the solar um, panel system and the, the, the battery 
and the gateway, they didn't bother to replace the electric meter. Now this is, was an, an old electric meter with a dial and when energy was being exported, it was actually running backwards, right? So I was exporting more energy than I was using from the grid. So I was getting, the my electricity readings was going down, all right? So now a lot of people said to me, oh, well, just don't tell the electric company, but um, I'm not like that. So I told them and um, so they wanted to install a smart meter. And I said, no way you're installing a smart meter in this house. Right. So that argument went on for quite some time. The person I was dealing with was convinced that it was compulsory for me to have a smart meter. I said, no, it's not. I don't have to have a smart meter. You need to source a digital meter, which is not a smart meter. Right, which will measure the incoming electricity correctly. Right? So this argument went on for ages. So the reason why I'm against the smart meter is that it's collecting a hell of a lot of information about your personal life and your personal activities, which I don't think is necessary. All the energy company needs to know is how much energy you've used and then you pay for that. They don't need to know when you're using it or how you're using it or whatever else. Yeah, so they, fir they first started saying that, yeah, they would put a smart meter in the property Right, but they would switch it into a non-smart meter mode. I said, no, I don't want that. I don't want any smart technology in my house. You need to supply a non-smart meter. So eventually they agreed to install a non-smart meter, a digital non-smart meter. And when the guy came to the door, I asked to see it first before I let him in the house. So this is the, the new digital non-smart meter that he's installed. Uh, this is the power coming in from the grid. Through the meter, uh, he's also installed a nice isolation switch, which is good. And the the power then goes um, in down into the well, goes through down into the gateway. The solar power from the panels is DC, but there's a there's an inverter in the loft, so there's a box of electronics in the loft which converts it to 240 AC, which comes in here, and that goes down into the gateway as well. Uh, obviously the battery is connected to the gateway and then the gateway then feeds the consumer unit uh, but I've also as I said I've installed this switch which can isolate everything from the consumer unit so I can provide my own power to the house from a from a generator outside 